Chapter Fourteen of Dave Dawson on Guadalcanal by Robert Sidney Bowen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Devil Eyes. A good fifteen minutes of silence settled over the two battle-scarred youths before it was broken, and when it was, it was not by either of them. On the contrary, it was broken by a third party by an unusually tall and well-built Japanese naval officer who opened the door of the empty cabin and came striding inside. Both boys were startled by his sudden approach, and they were amazed at his huge size, and they also noticed that he was unarmed, save for the samurai sword hung at his belt. But when they looked at his face, at his eyes, they both gulped impulsively. The newcomer's eyes were plenty Jap. They were also even more than that. The first impression that came to Dave was that he was looking into a pair of devil eyes, if ever a pair existed. They were more black than brown, and they had the sagging double upper lid that distinguishes a Jap's eyes from those of a Chinese. But there was still something else about them, a certain something that was in their depths. Call it all the hideous cruelty in the world reflected there, or call it the true look of a born killer and savage, or call it what you will. There was something there that made Dawson catch his breath and go hot and cold all over. It was like looking down the muzzle of a rifle and watching the finger crooked about the trigger tighten slowly. In the next split second, Come with me, please. The words that fell from the Jap's lips were like rifle shots. Hardly realizing that they were doing so, both youth sprang quickly up onto their feet. The big Jap smiled broadly. Good, he said, and bobbed his close-shaved head. I can see that you have learned a little of the lesson you should have learned a long time ago. Come with me, and do not let there be any trouble, please. As a warning gesture, the big Jap patted the hilt of his samurai sword and then stepped aside and jerked his head in a silent order for Dawson and Freddy Farmer to step by him and outside. They stepped out into a fairly wide companionway, and as the Jap motioned for them to move off to the right, they saw that the far end of the companionway opened up into what was obviously one of the hangar decks of the carrier. They could see Zeros and Nakajimas, and a couple of other types that they could not make out at that distance. They didn't have much time to study the parked planes they could see far ahead, however. The big Jap soon ushered them into a much narrower companionway off to the right, and then up a ladder. They came off the top of the ladder onto the broad flat flight deck of the carrier. It seemed covered from bow to stern with planes, with the narrow runway lane down the middle. Gazing at it, Dawson couldn't help but think of what a mess it would make if just a single plane taken off should skid to either side and lock wings with the long rows of parked planes. Or just a couple of well-placed incendiary bombs, he murmured absently to himself. Boy, what a bonfire that would be. Ah, Dave, Freddy Farmer whispered at his elbow. What was that? Nothing, pal, Dawson sighed. Just a little wishful thinking. At that moment, the big Jap gave them a gentle push and nodded along the flight deck in the direction of the flight bridge and ship control turrets. The two youths obeyed at once, and as Dawson weaved his way in and out among the parked planes, close-cropped Jap heads seemed to pop up from all sides and grin and leer at him. He paid them little attention, however. He was more interested in getting a look at the rest of the Jap force spread out over the surrounding waters. It was difficult, however, because folded wings and park fuselages kept cutting off his line of view. He did sight the two other carriers for a brief instant and sort of wished he hadn't. A three-carrier task force meant at least fifty other ships of different descriptions and a surprise force that size could cause a lot, an awful lot, of trouble. 
if it got the breaks. In fact, it might well change the entire course of the war in the far-flung Pacific. Fortunately for Dawson, he wasn't allowed much time in which to brood over that possibility. He and Farmer soon reached a point directly below the flight bridge. There the big Jap ushered them through a door and along a companionway and up a couple of more deck ladders. Their little walk finally terminated in the well-appointed quarters of none other than Admiral Suicide Sasebo himself. And the mad killer was there the flesh, too, flanked on both sides by his runt-sized staff officers and aides. Short, overfed, bandy-legged, and squint-eyed, the whole lot of them. At first glance, they looked like a bunch of cross-eyed street urchins, dressed up for a cops and robbers masquerade. If Dawson were to have seen the same picture flash across the screen in a movie theater, he would have fallen out of his seat with laughter. But there was no laughter on his lips now, not even in the back of his thoughts. Not one single giggle, for each pair of those eyes fixed upon him were not the eyes of a street urchin, but of an inhumane savage who would gladly carve him to shreds for the sheer joy of it all. No, there was no laughter in Dawson or Freddy Farmer as the big Jap pulled them up to an abrupt halt. Truth to relate, there was only a lot of cold fear and twice as much worry. Suddenly to Dave's tense senses, there came a sound akin to that of somebody putting sheets of tin to a buzzsaw blade. He jumped inwardly and then realized that the ear-rasping sound was the Jap behind him addressing his commanding officer in their native tongue. Impulsively, he looked at the row of Jap figures to make sure his guess as to which was Admiral Sasebo was correct. And it was correct. The little runt in the middle of the row, wearing fewer decorations than any of the others, made movements with his head as though somebody were working it with strings from behind, and then made some reply in a soft sing-song note. As the echo of the sound he made died away, he looked at Dawson and Farmer, and to their dumbfounded belief he smiled broadly and executed a slight bow. Welcome, honorable enemy gentlemen, he said, in fairly good English. It is a pleasure to have you aboard my ship. Be seated, please. I am about to dismiss my officers. Then we will discuss your little problem. The Jap Admiral bowed slightly again, then half turned and looked at the officers on one side. He said a few words, bobbed his head, and then turned to the officers on his other side and spoke to them. All of them bowed way over, murmured something, and went single file outside. And soon the cabin was empty, save for the two boys, the Admiral, and the big Jap officer. With an effort, Dawson tried to shake the cobwebs out of his brain and get himself on the alert. But it was like trying to wake himself up out of the middle of a crazy, cockeyed dream. In fact, that's just exactly what all this business seemed like. Like part of some dizzy dream in which nobody acts his correct part. Then we will discuss your little problem. What was going on here, anyway? And, welcome, honorable enemy gentlemen. Where did this guy get that welcome stuff? For fair, somebody was just plain nuts, and Dawson was worried not a little that maybe he was the one. Be seated, honorable enemy gentlemen, please. We have plenty of time, and in war it is a good thing to relax and be comfortable whenever one gets the chance. Yes, in those chairs behind you, please. If Dawson and Farmer had been under a complete hypnotic spell, they couldn't have obeyed more mechanically as they backed up until the chair edge hit them behind the knees and then sat down and like a couple of dazed puppets waiting to be moved around, they just sat there with eyes fixed on the Jap Admiral. He seated himself and stared at them for a long time before he spoke. So you have very interesting news for me, he suddenly said, with a rising inflection of voice. Well, I am interested. 
So tell me all about it, please. Dawson gulped slightly and tried desperately to bat his brains off the merry-go-round on which they were riding and get them to function properly. If he ever was to play a game of wits, this was the time. But at that precise moment, he couldn't have spoken his own name correctly for the life of him. Freddy Farmer, however, rushed to his rescue. The English youth looked the Jap Admiral straight in the eye and shook his head. Too late now, he said quietly. Neither of us knows where our force is now. It may be still up north, off your Japanese coast, or perhaps it is now steaming back to Pearl Harbor. That is too bad, the Jap said, without a single change of expression. I was hoping that perhaps I could detach one or two of my destroyers to go meet them and sink them. Both boys got the full meaning of the one or two destroyers crack, but both refused to rise to the bait. They simply shrugged and waited for the Jap Navy big shot to take the lead again. They thought they saw a faint flicker of anger cross his flat, shiny face, indicating that he was a little annoyed. But that's all the sign he gave. He stared at them each in turn for several more minutes, then seemed to fix his gaze on Dawson's face. You say there are five carriers, he asked. Yes, five carriers, Anne, Dawson replied, and then stopped dead as the walls of the room seemed to come tumbling down around his ears. He heard Freddy Farmer's startled gasp and wished in that moment that he possessed a gun so that he could shoot his brains out. Of all the stupid dumb fools he took the prize. With his bare face hanging out, he had walked straight into the Jap Admiral's trap and had been caught cold. In short, the Jap had suddenly addressed him in German, and without thinking, fathead that he was, he started to reply in the same tongue. And you Americans boast of being so very, very clever, the Jap Navy Big Shot was now sneering at him. Fools, little children, you are all soft and eaten away in the brain. You are finished. Do you not realize that? Dawson didn't say anything. He was mentally kicking himself too much to bother about speaking words. And God knows he had spoken too many words as it was, in the wrong tongue. Fathead of fatheads. Of course that Jap pilot rat had reported the entire conversation aboard the U-boat, had mentioned, no doubt, that he and the Nazi had spoken in German, so that the two prisoners wouldn't understand. But they had understood everything spoken, and now the Jap Admiral knew that they had understood. In short, he had only to add two and two to make a pretty sure guess that they hadn't spoken a word of truth aboard the U-boat and had played dumb in an attempt to pick up information they might use if they ever managed to escape. And to put it another way, the Jap Admiral had checkmated them cold when they had barely begun to sell him a load of phony goods. Yes, Japan's enemies are so cleverly foolish, the slant-eyed one continued, amidst hissing sounds. However, you are here under my watchful eye now, and no real damage has been done, so we will forget all else that has been said and start over again. The Jap stopped suddenly and leaned forward a little over the desk at which he had seated himself. You were shot down after having flown from an American carrier, he said. Now... What was the name of that carrier? The Tokyo Express, Dawson replied quickly. And the first stop is Tokyo, too, believe it or not. The faint attempt to wisecrack was completely lost on the flat-faced Jap, which was of course to be expected, for included in the countless things that the Japanese people do not possess is a sense of humor. Even a joke that would send an Englishman in the fits of laughter would sail right over a Jap, thick bone head. So the Admiral simply wagged his head from side to side, gravely, and made a little shaking motion with the index finger of his right hand. That's not the truth, he said, in his soft sing-song voice. The name of your carrier was either the Carson or the Hawk. 
They were both in a task force sighted two days ago. You come from one of those carriers, so it is proved that the force has moved up in the waters considerably north of where it was two days ago. That's what we've been saying, Freddy Farmer shot at him. The Carson and the Hawk, and you can guess how many other carriers, but much, much further north than you suspect. The Jap started to wag his head again gravely, but at that instant an inspiration, which might enable him to regain a little of the beans he had spilled, clicked in Dawson's brain. He held up a hand to check whatever the Jap Admiral was about to say. Just a minute, Admiral Sasebo, he cried out. Think what you like, but do some thinking. The war for my pal and me is all over. Ten to one, we'll never leave this ship alive. And how? The whole darn world knows what you Japs do to pilots you capture. Okay, we took our chances and we lost. So all that's left is a chance to rub it into you a bit because you're headed for a loss, too, see? Think I'm kidding? All right, then get this. Get hold of that double-crossing flying ape of yours who shot us down, and ask him what direction was our plane flying when he shot us down. Go ahead, ask him that, and he'll tell you south. And if he had his eyes open, he probably saw us dump our gas, hoping that the empty tank would keep us afloat longer but it was punctured, so the plane sank in a hurry. But here's the point. Ask him about how much gas he saw us dump to empty the tank. If he can't tell you, I can. It was practically a full tank. So figure it out, Admiral, figure it out. We were flying south with practically a full tank. Flying back to our carrier? Not a chance. We were scouting out from our carrier, trying to find if your force this force right here was trailing us up north. Dawson emphasized his words with a violent nod of his head, and then he added just one more word jab for good measure. Okay, throw us to the sharks. We're all washed up, but at least we've had the satisfaction of having the horse laugh on you. And what a horse laugh, as you'll soon find out. As Dawson got the last off his lips, he instinctively steeled himself and waited for the Jap Admiral to start screaming his head off. However, if he expected the Nippon Killer to fly into a tantrum, he was doomed to disappointment. Suicide Sasebo simply stared at him expressionlessly for a long, long time. Then he spoke in his native tongue, but his words were addressed to the big Jap standing just in back of the two air aces. Yet he held them with his eyes all the time he spoke. A few moments of silence followed his words, and then the big Jap spoke. A flicker of light or something seemed to pass across the Admiral's face, and then he spoke for the second time. The big Jap made hissing sounds, bowed low, and then took hold of Dawson's arm and Freddy Farmer's arm with fingers of steel and turned them around and led them out into the companionway. Bewilderment and a faint sense of uneasiness welled up in Dawson, for he had no idea what the two Japs had spoken to each other. And if only he did know, it would save so much for Freddy Farmer and himself. The first time Sasebo spoke, he had ordered the big one to take the two prisoners down onto the flight deck, shoot them, and toss their bodies over the side but he had only spoken thus to see if either of the prisoners understood Japanese. And when he realized that they did not, and the big Jap had made a polite suggestion, he had agreed at once, given the necessary instructions, and then ordered the two air aces to be taken away. End of Chapter 14